Hi, I'm Priyanka Vargadia, a developer advocate for Google Cloud, and in this video, I will unbox Google Cloud for you. Let's say you are a cloud architect for Foo.com. How would you build Foo.com on Google Cloud? There are many different ways of achieving the same goal, and no one way is right or wrong. Let's use this example to unbox Google Cloud and to see some of the approaches. By the end of this demo, you will understand how to navigate the Google Cloud Console and locate components needed to build any common application such as compute, storage, database options, and more such things. All right, let's get started. Well, first things first, if you're logged in to the console for the first time, create a project. A project is required to use Google Cloud and forms the basis for creating, enabling, and using all the Google Cloud services. I'm going to use this one for our demo today. On the left navigation, select Billing and link your billing account. You can go to billing anytime for an accurate, up-to-date picture of your cloud spend. You can view all products and learn more about them, read documentation, work on a quick start, and even navigate to the individual products. If you prefer to use the command line interface, from the top right corner, you can activate Cloud Shell, which is an online terminal preloaded with utilities such as the G Cloud command line tool, kubectl, and more. Now that we know how to navigate through the console, Let's look into unboxing a generic internet-facing application, foo.com, on Google Cloud. First, you need a virtual private cloud, VPC network, which provides managed networking functionality for all our Google Cloud resources. You can see one created here called FooNet with an automatic subnet. Inside this network, we will create our application infrastructure. For our app infrastructure, the web and app servers, we have multiple options depending on different factors. Your options are Cloud Run, App Engine, Kubernetes Engine, Compute Engine, and Anthos. If I choose to deploy serverless, then it means more time spent coding and less time spent worrying about infrastructure and scaling. Now, Cloud Run offers the ability to run serverless containers and App Engine is a managed app platform. If we want to run containerized apps but with more configuration and flexibility, then we would pick GKE. It helps us deploy containerized apps with Kubernetes without much of a learning curve while giving us the control over the configuration of nodes we want in our infrastructure. GKE also offers Autopilot, for when you need the flexibility and control, but have limited ops and engineering support. For an application in hybrid and multi-cloud platform, use Anthos. The maximum control option is Compute Engine. It is straight up virtual machines, so we can define the configuration of our machines depending on the amount of memory and CPU we need. But this control also means more responsibility to scale, manage, patch, and maintain them as needed. In this demo, we chose Compute Engine for our web and application server. Now, let's see how we set up Compute Engine to globally auto-scale our foo.com service. We will see an instance template, which we call foo template. Instance templates are saved virtual machine configurations used to create identical VMs. We need a template because we need the service to be created in multiple parts of the world as needed. In this template, you can see the type of machine, networking, storage, disk information, and any custom metadata. We can either create these identical VMs individually or as a part of managed instance groups. Here, you can also see that this instance template is used by three managed instance groups. If you click on any of them or navigate to instance groups on the left, you will see all the managed instance groups in three different zones, Asia, Europe, and US. Auto scaling is set to HTTP load balancing utilization of 80%, 
Which brings me to our load balancing. Load balancers distribute traffic to the servers. They can be applied to both external web servers and internal application servers. Under network services, you will see load balancing. Here we have created a load balancer with our three instance groups as backends. While setting and data in this video may be different from the demo project, the concepts and guidance apply. Cloud load balancing is a fully distributed and software defined system. It can literally respond to over millions queries per second and is based on any cast IP address. What does that mean? Well, it means that we can define our front-end infrastructure with a single IP address and our global users coming from Asia, US and Europe will be served their request from a server that is as close to them as possible. This is what our service looks like behind that single load balancing IP address. It also offers internal load balancing for our internal application servers and offers layer 4 TCP and UDP load balancing. Right at the load balancer, we have an option to enable Cloud CDN to cache the frequently requested media and web content closer to the user at the nearest edge location. This reduces latency and optimizes for last mile performance for our users. It also saves cost by fielding the request right at the edge without needing to send to the backend. And Cloud CDN would be caching content stored in Cloud Storage, our object store, where we store all of our media assets, CSS, JavaScript, basically everything static in nature. This means that the image we used on our web page is being served from cache. While we are on the topic of network services, Cloud DNS is Google's infrastructure for high volume authoritative DNS serving, which offers 100% SLA, meaning it never goes down. It uses our global network for Anycast named servers to serve the DNS zones from redundant locations around the world, providing high availability and low latency for the users. A foo.com might have some media processing functions for processing images and video files. It can be deployed on Cloud Functions, which is a serverless function as a service that scales as needed and can be triggered via HTTP, Cloud Storage, and other services. For asynchronous messaging services, we would use PubSub, send messages to a topic, and service could subscribe to that topic to receive those messages and send out the notifications. Now, coming to databases, we have a few choices here. For relational databases, we have Cloud SQL and Spanner, which are both managed. For generic SQL needs, MySQL, Postgres, and SQL Server, Cloud SQL is perfect. Spanner is best for massive scale relational databases that need horizontal scaling. It also supports strong consistency and acid transactions. I would say, you use Spanner when you need the benefits of both relational and non-relational databases. For non-relational databases, we've got three major options, Firestore, Bigtable, and Memory Store. Now, Firestore is a serverless document database that can be used as DB as a service, easy to set up, and provides fast results to complex queries in real time. It also supports offline data and syncs, which make it a great choice for mobile use cases along with web, IoT, and gaming. Bigtable, on the other hand, is a wide column NoSQL database that supports heavy reads and writes with extremely low latency. This makes it a perfect choice for events, time series data from IoT devices, click streams, ad events, fraud, recommendations, and other personalization related use cases. Memory Store is a fully managed in memory data store service for Redis and Memcached at Google Cloud. It is best for in memory and transient data stores offers extremely low latency and high performance. Memory Store is great for web and mobile gaming, leaderboards, social chats, and newsfeed type applications that require in-memory database caches as well. 
Next part of the puzzle is analytics. We usually have real-time and batch data to ingest. Real-time data could be content from servers such as clickstream data or from IoT device sensors. Batch data could be from your logs. Now, these are obviously just examples. Once the data is ingested, we process and enrich it to clean it up and make it ready for downstream systems. Then store it in a data warehouse for further analysis. A data warehouse is a storage where you keep processed data. Now, data analysts then analyze the data and create dashboards for broader consumption. Data scientists can pick up that data from the data warehouse and use it for creating machine learning models to generate predictions. You could also directly ingest data from storage systems for ML models. We can ingest the batch data from cloud storage and real-time data from applications using PubSub, which is a serverless messaging service that scales to ingest millions of events per second. Now, data flow can then be used for processing and enriching the batch and streaming data. It's based on open source Apache Beam. If you are in the Hadoop ecosystem, then use Dataproc. It is managed Hadoop and Spark platform that is set up to analyze the data faster instead of worrying about managing and standing up your own Hadoop cluster. It literally spins up a cluster in 90 seconds. BigQuery is a serverless data warehouse that can also act as long-term storage and a data lake. We can run SQL queries to analyze our data within BigQuery and it literally queries over petabytes of data and responds in seconds due to the underlying separation of storage and compute, which is unique to BigQuery. We can use this data from BigQuery to create a dashboard in Looker and Data Studio. It also offers machine learning capabilities so we can create machine learning models and make predictions by just writing some SQL statements. Now, for ML and AI projects, we can use the data in BigQuery or cloud storage to train our models in Vertex AI, or we can import our media files, image, and other unstructured data from cloud storage as well. Now, machine learning and AI, our options depend on whether we want to create our own custom model or use a pre-trained model. My recommendation is to always start with a pre-trained model, see if it works for your use case. The most common use cases are all covered, including images, text, video, and tabular data. If a pre-trained model does not work for your use case, then use the AutoML model in Vertex AI to train a custom model on your own dataset. AutoML supports all the common use cases. You can evaluate the model and look at metrics to improve your model. It deploys the model for you and provides you with an API endpoint. In case you have lots of machine learning and data science expertise in-house, that is only when I would say, write your own custom model code in the framework of your choice, such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, and then train your model on a pre-built or a custom container. For operations, monitoring, debugging, and troubleshooting, Cloud Operations Suite offers all the tools needed to keep track of the resources and applications. When it comes to security, understand that security in cloud is a shared responsibility. Google Cloud offers the inherent infrastructure security and the tools that you would need to protect your application, data, and your software. The data is already encrypted at rest and in transit. You can also bring your own custom keys for encryption too. For data loss prevention and protecting PII information, you have DLP, which helps mask and tokenize sensitive data in BigQuery, cloud storage, or even on-premises. For user authentication, you have cloud identity, which checks if the user is who they say they are. And for authorization, you have cloud IAM, where you can define who has access to what. Security Command Center continuously monitors your Google Cloud environment for visibility into the system, discover vulnerabilities, detect threats, and show that so you can take actions on them. 
There are lots of other security features that I did not dive into here, but go ahead and play around when you create your own project. We just took a tour of most of the Google Cloud services for an example application, foo.com. We looked at some services for networking, compute, storage, databases, data analytics, machine learning, security, and operations. There is definitely a lot more to explore, but I'm confident this will get you started with the right background. Now it's your turn. I encourage you to sign up for a free trial and follow this tutorial yourself.